Welcome to the herd and thanks for listening. If you enjoy this sodcast, please like it, share it, give it a good rating and follow, and help more people find their way into the Ruminati herd. If you have suggestions for improvements, please let me know. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Meet Your Herdmates Sodcast. I'm very pleased today to be joined by Dr. Matt Poor. Uh, Dr. Poor is professor of animal science. He's beef extension specialist, uh, as well as wearing other hats at North Carolina State University. Thank you for joining us. Nice to be here, Peter. Glad, glad to be invited. Glad to give you a break from making hay, mm-hmm. although you said it was done for the day. So it's mm-hmm. um, so full disclosure, we've worked together on various efforts, so we've known each other for a while. Um, but how about you just introduce yourself um, a little bit to the audience if if you had 45 seconds at a dinner party um, to introduce yourself what how would you do that okay so so I'm I'm Matt poor I, I am a professor at NC State and uh, I always have to qualify by saying that's my second job uh, and my sideline I'm a farmer and when I as I grew up I I really took um, a connection to the land and I've always at, in my heart I've always been a farmer and uh, yet I, I grew up uh, and grew up on a farm in a very uh, uh, a challenging place in the country to farm which is north of Raleigh in North Carolina great place to grow tobacco uh, not a very good place to grow anything else and uh, and so as uh, uh, so I grew up in tobacco production uh, uh, we little little sideline on that. I did um, grow up primarily in Arizona, but my dad was from here and he wanted this family to be connected with agriculture. So he bought this small tobacco farm and and we um, we became tobacco farm kids during the summer for, for my entire time growing up. And I started learning about a lot of things, including forages. And at the time, um, I was told that the reason we had cows was because there was part of the land here that wouldn't do anything but just hold the rest of the land together. And that land was pretty good for raising a few cows. And so that was the tension cows were given. They generally were let roam and do what they would until uh, the grass was gone. And then they maybe cut down trees for them or they fed them some hay if they had it. But they were definitely a side a sideline uh, in what they did. So I love that. And I, for many years, I wanted to be a tobacco farmer. I wanted to be like my dad and his friends. And, and he was a, again, full disclosure, he's a medical doctor, but, um, he, he did, um, he did have his heart in farming and he grew up on a small tobacco farm in the mountains of Virginia. So he, he had that in his heritage. And we, as, as time went on, you know, we did that, but I also had a chance to work on ranches in Arizona. And uh, he had several friends that were uh, that had ranch, you know, doctors that had ranches. And, and so I got to go out, ride a horse, round up cattle and learn a little bit about range management. And it amazed me how good the cows looked there in Arizona, how how beautiful they were, slick, fat, you know, this and this being in, in kind of mountain country. But um, they. Um, and there was virtually no grass. I mean, you walked out and you just wonder what they ate. Well, of course, uh, the stocking rate is such that there's about, you, you run, uh, you know, somewhere around 50 acres per cow in that environment. And they do find some to eat. They have to look, but they they do find plenty to eat. And um, and it, it, always, it always mystified me why cattle here just looks, they just look so terrible in the summertime. And, um, just, it just seemed, and I thought it was just genetics and people being a little backwards in their ways. But as I, as I grew up, I started to realize there were, there, there were things like toxic fescue, which is a, the dominant forage in our region. And that makes that, that, that's the predominant reason that they look so bad in the summertime. But also the fact that in Arizona, they, were the front line. They weren't the sideline. They were the enterprise. And so they were doing everything like worming and vaccinations and castrating the bull calves and all the things that the cows roaming the land that held, uh, you know, the, the land that was not good for, for crops. They didn't get any of that. They were virtually unmanaged. And 
And when they had it, they had a need, they needed a new uh, uh, washing machine, for example, they'd go get a bull calf and take him to town and get their $200 and go get a washing machine. That's the way that they looked at it. A little savings account that uh, the Lord had given them uh, on the side here. So, so anyway, so as I grew up and started thinking about what I wanted to do, um, I really had this idea. I wanted to come to North Carolina and raise cattle and try to do it more like the way that it was done in Arizona. And, um, and so I did, when I graduated, I, I did go through University of Arizona in animal science and um, got my bachelor's degree and my whole entire goal in the world was to farm and to come here uh, to this farm and, um, and kind of see tobacco out the door and replace that enterprise with cattle. Yeah. So uh, with a when, when did, when did the, the tobacco marketing change so dramatically that was in the eighties or nineties. That was in the nineties when they had the tobacco buyout. And by that time we actually had already um, got out of the tobacco business. And this was a growing um, ethical concern for my father who, and my, and my mother was a nurse. So they were, they were medical professionals and um, it became harder and harder for my dad to justify in his mind. I, I grow the stuff and then I tell people not to smoke it because it's going to yeah. kill. Them. So mm. they, so he, he decided to, to sell the tobacco um, allotment because that's the way it was regulated on both of what we have actually two farms, both farms, the tobacco allotments were sold. And then that money was used to, to establish pasture and on those fields, buy cows and, and uh, and do those sorts of things. So we uh, we did that in the late '80s. That was before the buyout. And uh, at that time, you couldn't get very much for your allotment. But we did uh, we did sell our right to grow tobacco. Yeah. Um, so, and then the challenge became: How do you make a li- you know without tobacco? Now what do you do? Um, timber is the other enterprise that uh, that is is present in a very visible way. Um, uh, and basically, people just let their land grow up, and then they later they realize, wow, we have, now we have a timber business. They, they abandoned a lot of crop land across the, the entire um, county I'm from. Um, mm. So what, what was your major going through graduate school, which was also at University of Arizona, or was that? Yes. So I, so, so let me just continue the story a little bit. So my wife, who I met in, in who was a graduate student at University of Arizona, we were married uh, just before I uh, graduated, and we we came here to farm. She also uh, had a master's degree in ruminant nutrition, but she wanted to farm just the same way I did. And and uh, so we returned here for a couple of years. That was in the early '80s, and um, and it was a time in agriculture when it was it, we we were in some of the worst um, uh, financial straits for that agriculture had ever seen at that time. Prices were low for everything. Um, land values were low. It was just, it was, it was virtually, it was, it was extremely difficult to make a living. So we loved farming, but every day we got considerably poorer. And I mean, seriously, every day. And and by the end of a year, we realized we can, there's no way we're going to make a living. Um, we were, we were being paid a small, um, salary. That was the agreement with my dad. And then, then we had to develop enterprises to, to make a living. I mean, it wasn't enough to make a living. It was enough to go to the grocery store and maybe fix a flat tire on the car, you know, or something. I mean, it wasn't, we didn't get paid much, but we got a grub stake, if you will, to start. And it didn't take long for us to realize, and this perhaps was the lesson my dad was, was going for, was that mm-hmm. uh, we're not going to make a living. We're not going to be living like we grew up mm-hmm. if we do this for a living. And, and I, I, I look back on that often, Peter, and wonder if that was a if that was a mistake or or a genius that that we decided to go back to school. Um, because I I have other friends that stayed in farming at that time that you know that that are doing great. I mean, they made it, and so I know that we would have, you know, but I don't know if my marriage would have lasted or any of those kinds of things that you get in stress with. But long story short, we both went back to graduate school. I got a, uh, Jeanette got a PhD. I got a master's and, and, and then 
uh, they talked me into going ahead and getting a PhD. So I got all my degrees at University of Arizona in feedlot and dairy nutrition. So that's my my training. Mm -hmm. So I'm a I am a basically a TMR nutritionist by training. That's that's okay. that was what I what I was trained to do. TMR. Uh, total mixed ration. So I was I was trained in the science of analyzing every ingredient carefully, uh, sitting at the at the computer and figuring out how the ideal, um, the optimal way of combining all of those ingredients you have at hand, and then making a diet where the animal every every bite they ate was exactly what they need. Mm -hmm. And and it is it's it, well you're aware it's it's um, it's many of us are trained that way and it does work. Now, when I, uh, when I got done, um, with my degree, I just had in my heart, I want a farm. I want, I'm a farmer. What am I going to do? And I was a research, I was trained in, you know, re feedlot research and that sort of thing, dairy research. And my boss, um, you know, he was excited because I was good. I was a good student and I had done well and was being recruited by Cornell and a couple of other universities at the time as, uh, you know, as I approached graduation and a job came available in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, just an hour and 15 minutes from our farm in beef extension. And I took it to my advisor and I said, Hey, look at this job. This is, and it was a year before I was actually supposed to be done. So it was a little bit premature, but I was like, man, this mm -hmm. is the location. I don't know about this extension thing. And he said, well, I want to be honest with you, Matt, the very best students go into research and teaching. The ones that can't get a good research teaching position settle for an extension job. Mm, ouch. And um, and so just keep that in your mind that, that that's that's the perception across our profession. Mm. And. Um, and yes, there's some merit to working in extension and, and working with farmers and that sort of thing. So, so I, um, I was a little bit disappointed and he said, well, apply, you know, it doesn't hurt to go down there and show them what a great research scientist you are. And they'll, you know, who knows what you'll find. But, uh, and so I was, well, you know, students, I mean, I was just like, my balloon was popped, you know, it was like, mm. oh no, I thought that was the answer. So the next day, Dr. Swingle, who, who was my advisor, called me into his office and he said, I, I want to talk to you. He said, I, I'm, I may have just been inappropriate yesterday um, talking to you about this job you were interested in. And come to find out, he'd had a whole bunch of um, administrative hassles through the afternoon that day, research and research stuff blew up on him and stuff. And and he and he said, now, I, I've been thinking about you and your interests and whatever. And, you should seriously consider that job. Um, he said, I, you know, I've looked, I looked at it and it does have a research appointment. It has a 25% research appointment, 75% extension. And so we don't have that here. So maybe I, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but I don't want you to go down there thinking it's not a good job. I want you to go down there and do your best. Um, I, at the time, I had long hair and a beard, Peter, much longer than the one I'm sporting today. And uh, so once I got an interview, got called for an interview, and uh, one of my committee members said, uh, are you going to you going to sh shave and cut that hair before you go down there? And I said, um, Dr. Huber, I'm an honest person, and they're going to have to take me for what I, they get. This is what I look like. And um, he said, well, they don't necessarily have to know that right away. Just keep, just, just think about it. <laughs> so I went home and I was like, I'm not, I mean, I was kind of a little bit of a radical person at the time. You know, I was a, I was a Southern Arizona boy. And I, um, so I, I, I started obsessing with it at night, Peter. So for about three nights, I couldn't sleep. I was thinking, what, what if that was the only reason I didn't get that job? So one day I went home from the lab a little early. I, I got a pair of scissors and went and bought a razor and and uh, didn't, I didn't worry about my hair that day, but I took the beard off. And uh, 
my spouse, it was her, she loved it. So when I came, when, when she came home and found me, she didn't know what to think. But anyway, <laughs> uh, long story short, Peter, I got the job and later was told uh, by my colleagues that if I had come down here like that, they, I never would have got the mm. job, never would have got it. So um, in and fact, this was, they, this was when this was 1990. Okay. 31 years ago. Mm hmm. So it was actually 89 when I interviewed, but, um, and things have changed considerably. I was a, I was a, um, philosophical non tie wearer and they tried to teach me that and I refused and that sort of thing. I learned that one pretty quick when I got to NC state, that it was, a, it was a tie, still a tie wearing environment. So, <laughs> um, so I did for many, and, and, and then later, um, mid, mid career, I always had a tie on and no one else my style took over and no one wore a tie, but me for at some, some point, I don't wear one very often anymore, but anyway, <laughs> it's a safety, so that's how it's I a safety issue me. around, around equipment. Around equipment. Yeah. 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 But, they, but again, the philosophy, I, I had a very different philosophy on extension. They were, they wanted to be the, the sharp professionals that came from Raleigh. And, um, one time I was introduced at a, at a, at a county meeting. I, I came to love to do county, um, county meetings and, we have 100 counties in North Carolina. 70 of them have some kind of a livestock association. They meet for dinner meetings in the winter, typically. And so I, when I first came, I got opportunity to go to 30 or 40 counties a year to talk to this little intimate, you know, some of them were big, but most of them were 30 people size. And, and when they, they all know each other. And so you get these very, very nice interactions with people. And so I, I uh, you know, early on, I was in my tie and, you know, my, my nice clothes and everything. And, and, um, and I got introduced to one of these meetings and, and uh, the guy, it was just kind of a joke, but the guy said, uh, I'm a, I, I've got a great speaker tonight. Um, it's another one of them dudes from Raleigh. <laughs> Name's Matt Poor. And, and I, and I was like, and afterwards I was like, what you know I, I don't know i don't like that he said well there's a there, there's a there's a little you know our little local joke about you know what's the scariest thing a farmer can see can can hear and that's i'm from raleigh and i'm here to help you <laughs> and so he said you need to think about that because that's the way people think about <laughs> a dude a dude from raleigh and a tie that comes out to do this kind of meeting they listen to you because they've got a free meal, but, mm. but if you but feed they them, they, will they don't come. trust. No, they don't trust dudes from wrong. They basically is yeah. what I was told. So, so I realized, and then it was, it was okay because I realized, okay, maybe I don't, may, maybe this is not, you know, maybe, maybe I, I'm getting the wrong advice from, from some people. So, mm. so again, this, this good friend became a good friend of mine, a farmer. And, um, he, um, we went to a meeting one time. And he was, he, he, he was a farmer. He worked for extension, that sort of thing. And so he took me to a County meeting in, in Wilkes County, which is a very, uh, it was a big group and a bit, but a mountain County, very difficult. They, they hated dudes from Raleigh. Um, and, uh, so when I got to his house and he was going to take me to the meeting, he said, he said, lose the tie. And I said, Hey, they told me I had to wear this. He said, you did wear it. Take it off. <laughs> he said, Excellent. when you get back to Raleigh, if you feel the need, put it back on. Yeah. Don't wear it yeah. out here. It, it's the worst thing you can do. So, the, so the I, yeah. The Go extension ahead. service when it's functioning properly is this two-way bridge. And it's its intention has always been to serve the rural communities. It's expanded since its inception. But the ideal is communicating research-based information, based information, and then communicating back to the sort of mothership institution what research needs are. And, and it's accessible throughout the United States. You don't have to be in agriculture to access the information. 
Much of it is either at cost or free, depending on where you are and what the budget constraints are. So um, for people who are interested in any topic whatsoever, their local extension service is a place that I try to point people toward. But again, sometimes the attitudes can get in the way of that information communication um, if we're not paying attention. Um, and I yeah, like that yes. answer. You did wear it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so anyway, so we're um, North Carolina is very bland. And what I came to learn, you know, once I got here and learned about extension in North Carolina, it was very different from Arizona. And that was why my my boss there didn't really have a good, clear understanding of it. But in North Carolina, we have a um, a live we have somebody with livestock responsibilities in every county. Now, some of them have two counties. Um, but but two or three counties, but we have about 70 um, livestock and forage agents in North Carolina. They're very, you know, they're they're um, a young group for the, you know, in very in the very large part. They're uh, they're either bachelor's or master's degrees. They're very smart people. Um, and my challenge is to train them, and then to, and, and as I'm an extension specialist, so my my role is to provide uh, expertise in a given area, and there are specialists in all the commodities. And you know, there's there's a, a corn specialist and cotton specialist and pork and all that. So I'm a, I, I work with the beef and forages programs in in the college and small and ruminants to, too. Small ruminants, yes, absolutely. And um, and we we have a we have a new small ruminant person, which might be somebody you'd want to talk to at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, but these, uh, we, so, so that, so this is how extension should work in my mind. And we have it working pretty well here. So the extension agents work with the farmers and they develop these close personal relationships with their farmers and they teach them the, the, what they need to know. I mean, they, they, they figure out what it is that they need through advisory committees, and then they conduct educational programs with those farmers. Now, sometimes we have uh, the an educational program that is so widely needed that it's developed at the state level, and so I I, um, I am the director of a program called Amazing Grazing, and Amazing Grazing is a a, a program that teaches pasture ecology um, and the uh, the general principles of how how to manage forages in a in, in a dynamic system like we have to deal with. And so we, we train not just extension agents, uh, we also train NRCS, we train, train veterinarians. All the people that give advice to farmers, we, we, we provide training to them. And, uh, and we also do applied research under, the, under that, uh, that program, Amazing Grazing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, so, that, that, and so it's beneficial because the agents can have us come and do a, an Amazing Grazing demonstration workshop in their county. They have a really, you know, a, well-trained staff that come in and do the work, help do the workshops and they provide the local arrangements and that sort of thing. And so it's a very good partnership. Then we also have partners in research. I mean, you know, full time, I mean, even with USDA uh, agronomists and that sort of thing that, that we're in, we're in teams with them on big projects. And so um, the, as you say, um, to be productive, we need to know what the problems are we should be working on. So my role would be to understand the field problems a little bit better than the research people do, and then also be able to take the findings quickly to the to the farmers because I've developed the rapport with them, and you know they know I don't wear a tie and all that kind of stuff. So they they listen to me, and and a researcher from from Raleigh that speaks in big terms, and you know I mean it's just because that's their their training. That's what they do. They, they, they do experiments, they get grants, they write journal articles, you know, they don't really work directly with farmers. Mm. So that's my role. So I'm the bridge between the practical application and the detailed research. It puts me in a wonderful position, but it's a challenge because I have to understand some real technical stuff, but I also have to know what motivates a farmer to decide what seed they're going to buy or what forage species they're going to plant next and and those kinds of things that that um, they might ask that question to a researcher and get a you know, 30 minute answer and have no idea what they should do right yeah so, so i'm a little bit more in tune with that 
And, and you mentioned the the amazing grazing program being a train the trainer, but also then grazing school sort of thing for producers. Uh, is that part of amazing grazing? Yes. Or that- so yeah. our our model. So this is our model, uh, Peter. We we um, we use on farm demonstrations to teach. So for the most part, we are on private farms. And we work with the producer on a practice that has been proven by research. I'll uh, just give you an example, if we want to, the novel end of fight tall fescue. Uh, that it's proven by research, it works. We need more farmers to see it in action. So we will uh, we'll recruit farmers if we've got some funding to do that kind of project. They'll put a field in, we'll help them, and we'll work with their local advisors. So typically these farmers know their extension agent. They also have an NRCS conservationist or a soil and water which is the state equivalent that they work with. And they may have a um, agronomist from the Department of Agriculture or something like that. But we'll, we'll establish this local team. And then together, we'll go through what it takes to establish the crop, what it takes to manage it. And then sometime during the experience, we will have a workshop. And we, we are, they're pretty informal workshops. We don't, you know, we're not trying to get 100 people or whatever. What we want is we want the farmers, 10 to 20 uh, friends, neighbors. <clears throat> and the idea is to plant the seed and then let them learn from their friend that this really works. Not from us. We All we can do is help them to, to, to be successful. And, and so the audience, and, and so typically the farmer will say, well, yes, it wasn't as hard as I thought. Um, I, I got some good support from my extension agent and and Dr. Poor was here, but now my agent knows what to do. And so, uh, you know, if you want to try it, I, I'll help you, you know, whatever. And so it's really helps us to get adoption of things that are, are hard to, uh, to get people to do. And so uh, that, that is basically our, what we call the amazing grazing model. And we've used it with a lot of different uh, practices. There's different hooks and projects that we can get to get on the farms. We've done some work with um, nutrient distribution across the landscape, kind of helping a farmer visualize where the, the phosphorus is high and where it's low so that they can use that uh, in their management. Things like um, the response to nitrogen on, on, a, on, a, um, on a, just a common crop that we fertilize. We, we, we know what the responses are on research stations and there is some, some interesting work going on to suggest that maybe things are a little different on real on, on, I don't mean real on private farms as opposed to the public research stations. And so um, we've really etched out kind of a role in this on-farm research uh, arena as well uh, through this program. So um, let's, let's unpack a couple things. Cause uh, okay. um, so you mentioned endophyte and you mentioned novel endophyte. So what, what is an endophyte? Okay. So I, I mentioned earlier how terrible cows look on my farm in the summer. And, and I, I just, I didn't know why I, I grew up not knowing why, but I attended the first, actually the first, um, the first American society of animal science meeting I ever attended. I was an undergraduate student at the time, I believe it was 1980. And, um, and I was able, I, I just got the opportunity to come. It was a soup. He really gave me a big, uh, vision of what I might be able to do um, with my career and my life, but they had an entire session on on uh, what they were calling the uh, the toxic fungus in fescue, and I knew enough to know that our our grass was tall fescue, and so I was just kind of drawn to those sessions just because I didn't uh, a lot of the other stuff I didn't understand the words and the title, you know, let alone what the heck they were talking about, but I knew about fescue. So what I learned was that. They had recently discovered that the tall Kentucky 31 tall fescue was infected with a fungus that lived in between the plant cells, not on the surface like we think about something being moldy, but right up inside of the plant where you can't see it. And that 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 fungus produced toxins and they had just discovered that ergovaline was the one that they thought was the number one toxin, but they really knew very little bit about it at the time. Um, but they were pretty sure that it was, a, you know, that it was some bad stuff if animals mm-hmm. ate it. So anyway, I, so I learned about that early. I was really excited to, 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 to learn. And it was one of the things that made me realize, man, maybe, 
Mm. You know, this, this, this is pretty cool stuff. You know, it applies so, directly to my, my situation. Kentucky 31 is one variety of tall fescue. It's been planted on millions of acres. When I had a conversation with Dr. Lacefield, um, he went over the history of that, um, you know, the, the, the grass and its, well, you mentioned it earlier, holding land together. Um, tall fescue did that for many, many acres across the southeast that it prevented soil erosion and would persist in a very challenging environment. Uh, unfortunately, for reasons that it just it happened that this fungus was always present in that breeding line and and uniquely with an endophyte this this doesn't form infectious bodies it doesn't transfer from non-infect or from infected to non-infected plant it's only transferred by seed kind of a unique and and so then a novel is what what is what so we have okay, the so, the toxic and then yeah so there's a, sort, of, sort of a long story behind this and i i know you you've already you know you've already heard it but maybe the the audience would like to know a little bit but the first solution that was thought about was of course we just kill the fungus out of this plant yeah, and simple. so there's a lot of work done with spraying, a lot of a lot of work done with spraying, spraying fungicides on pasture. Didn't really didn't again getting inside the plant was a challenge, and they, they were not able to to easily uh, kill it with with the the fungicides they had. So that was off the list. Uh, they did find that with um, aging, that they the, the the fungus died before the seed um, became unviable. So they were pretty quickly able to establish. Um, plants of, again, the main variety, Kentucky 31, but there were some other varieties being worked with at the time, but they were able to establish that without the fungus in it. And it looked like tall fescue. I mean, it's like, okay, here it is. That's the answer. We just sell people this seed that doesn't have the fungus in it. Everything will be fine. Well, um, just to make a long part of the story short, it didn't work. We found that the the adaptation of that plant, what made that plant so good in conservation and, and production, as you, as you mentioned, it was the fungus. And then not only that, it was the, the marriage between that particular fungus and that particular plant was just an especially good one. So, so uh, the next phase of the research then was, okay, if this fungus is critical, is there anything we can do to change the fungus? And um, at that time, they had discovered that these, these fungi were in ryegrass and fescue and bahia grass and lots of other plants. And we know now it's really a lot of plants that have these, these endophytes in as first discovered in fescue. Um, and so a, a group, a research group out of New Zealand was able to find some, some um variants to use what words that we're hearing a lot these days variants of that fungus that could not produce the ergot toxins or the ergovalene and uh, they so they 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 found those they 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 uh, kept them alive and they brought them back and they introduced them into uh, the varieties of fescue that were being developed uh, looking for this again this great marriage and that became that that turned out to be a lot harder than they thought but once they found a good variety of fescue that would, would go together with one of those non-toxic or, non, or what we call the novel um, uh, endophyte, that then that, that plant had the, the toughness and the, the, the ruggedness of the, uh, of the Kentucky 31 tall fescue, but it did not give those negative effects on the animal. Now, it can be more complicated than that, of course, as you know, Peter, but but bottom line is this novel endophyte tall fescue. It's a shame that that wasn't what was in that original uh, plot, you know, because we'd have a different world. We, and who mm -hmm. knows? Mm -hmm. But well, we, know yeah. That, yeah, we know that to be very productive, and that's going to probably lead into the next little piece of what I'm going to tell you about here. But uh, to be really, really productive, we, we've got to get that fungus off the off our land i mean the, the long-term goal has got to be we got to do something about this now it's naive to think we'll ever get rid of all of it but uh but certainly 
where we have the ability um, and thinking about the long term life of a new stand, it, it definitely is going to be something that we need to we need to do for a variety of reasons. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that once we get into it. So uh, uh, another episode that I'd refer people to is a conversation with Dr. Bowton um, that goes over um, some of the development work and, and that adoption. Um, so we, we have these millions of acres that are planted to this one particular variety that has this unique relationship with the fungus, but it produces these harmful compounds to animals. So what beyond they just don't look very good, what sorts of harm comes to the livestock that are grazing this and and what kinds of livestock could be impacted by it? OK, so so basically all all livestock are impacted in some ways um, and, and some different than others. Horses, for example, they don't they don't have um, some of the common symptoms we see in cattle and other ruminants, but they do have terrible problems with their. Uh, with their babies, with with giving birth, uh, the the system is not is not work properly uh, to allow them to give birth at the proper time. So they carry the pregnancy much longer than they should. The the fetus gets bigger than it should be, and they have a lot of problems with that. So that's the main problem in horses, in in cattle, uh, and 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 sheep and goats as well. Uh, they well, the main thing that we see with that is that it decreases their their desire to eat the feed. Is the is the main that to eat the grass is the, the number one problem. They just don't eat as much, and so they don't they they just don't have as much fuel to do their their daily job with. In addition to that, those um, those toxins actually interfere with some of the uh, the hormone receptors and um, and in 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 the brain basically, and they cause some some imbalances in some of the the body's hormones. And, uh, and that leads to them not shedding off their hair, their winter hair. They don't shed. They don't. Uh, uh, so that gives them even more heat stress. That causes them to eat even less. And it's just kind of, a, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those uh, um, spirals downhill. So, uh, so, this is, uh, that, so, so basically what we have here in North Carolina, we have a, a cow-calf uh, enterprise is our main thing. And this is where we keep jerk cows. They have a baby. We raise them to about six, seven months of age. Then they are, they're, they're wean. You know, our recommendation for a, a modern farm doing this, wean the calves for about six weeks, and then they can go on into the market channel and, and they go to the feedlots in, in the hot, largely in the high plains. Um, and the reason that that works is because that cow is a little more resilient to the toxins than the young growing animals so the cow gets along okay i mean she doesn't feel good or whatever we also have our babies come in the fall so that they are uh, they're born in once the weather starts to cool off the animals are much more comfortable and they're because of the, the annual cycle of toxins they're they're a little bit detoxified at that point and uh, and then when they are in the breeding season which that's the a cow has to become pregnant again once a year to to, to be productive uh, once with the breeding season is in January, February, when it's cool. And so we don't have problems with them getting pregnant that they would have if they were in, trying to be bred in the summer. So basically, because of the way that we do things uh, here, fall calving, cow calf system, we can get uh, a cow can raise a nice calf that has a lot of potential in the feedlot. Good gene if you use good genetics. You get a good price for them. And then the calf goes and, and you don't have to worry about how to, you know, the challenge of growing it up on this toxic forage. The cow just kind of chews her cud and goes along and she's, she has to live on it and she can't. Um, now, the reason that uh, we, one of my main uh, pursuits these days, Peter, and we're, we're working on this some together is to try to get people to use this novel endophyte tall fescue when it's appropriate, where it will help them. Now, these guys that have a um, extensive cow calf, Operation like they got 300 cows spread out on eight farms and they drive by and you know they 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 get them up if they get out that's about all they do they sell the calves they're making money doing that and so um, that's a tough audience to try to get them to 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 
go ahead and start adopting this non-toxic kind of a, a, of a forage for their system because it's working for them, you know. Um, now, for me, it's not working for me because the reason I'm doing this, Peter, is I, as you've gathered by this point, is because I love the land. I love my cows. I want to go away from here every day feeling like, man, we've got this thing going in the right direction. And this time of year, this is June, May and June, my cows are absolutely miserable. And uh, we have a large, you know, this is a fairly large farm and uh, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for me given my, my work, you know, my, my, my day job. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a challenge for me to try to figure out how do we get rid of all this and get, and get the novel established. It's not as easy as it sounds. So we are going, but we are doing it. We're going a bit at a time across our farm and we're about halfway there, but still the mature cow herd because they can deal with it better than the young ones. They are on some pastures that are still prominently toxic, uh, Kentucky 31 tall fescue. And it breaks my heart, Peter, to, to go out there and realize, my, I mean, I'm doing this because I love these cows and I'm making them stand here and suffer like this. They, they typically um, are showing the signs of heat stress, even on a fairly cool day. They want to get in water. They lay in mud. They have a very rough hair coat and, um, the, if the readers want to read more about that, I, I, there's actually some stuff in novel notes, which is our newsletter from the Alliance for Grassland Renewal. I'll just refer you to that. There's some stories I've written recently about this, but, um, we, I, I really, I'm, I'm on a mission to change the farm, not necessarily because I'm going to make more money, but because I'm going to be happier and, and because my cows are going to be more comfortable and uh, and more um, more like in life. I mean, May and June should be they should be loving May and June, Peter. Mm -hmm. And cows in a toxic fescue environment do not feel good in May and June. Yeah. And and I think that there's perhaps not in North Carolina, but in other parts of the country, there's some real good data showing economic return by improvement in conception rate, improvement in live births, improvement in in cow condition and calf gain and then if if you had feed that could support better gain on young animals that might open up some other enterprise options that currently can't because you have a feed that would not support the the kind of economic gain and carcass quality that you would want from some of those things so yes. I, I i in addition i i think i've said before that uh, New Zealand needed the toxic. We needed the toxic endophyte in in tall fescue prior to the novels. We needed it to maintain tall fescue. It would die out due to climate stress and and other biotic stresses. In New Zealand, they needed the endophyte that produces ryegrass staggers prior to novel endophytes because without it, an insect would kill the perennial ryegrass that was the base of their pasture systems. Well, they no longer need that. And so now the idea of not using uh, a novel endophyte perennial ryegrass is just, it's, it's, it's essentially an issue of animal welfare at this point, that um, the, there isn't a, a justification for it. And we're not there yet. And the forage seed industry is or market is very different between U.S. and other countries, and that's a topic for another day. Um, but so, so okay, just briefly to maybe kind of wrap that issue or not, is um, how do you go from an infected stand to this new novel stand of tall fescue? Um, is there something left behind that could infect the new? How does a farmer do that kind of thing? So, Peter, so we, I, I'm, I've started thinking about two, two ways of thinking about this, Peter. So the one is uh, the one that we've really pushed through the Alliance and, and through the Alliance for Grassland Renewal, which is a group of universities and seed companies, others that work together on this, on this uh, proven technology. But um, what, uh, what, we, what we have developed are several systems that have been proven through research to, to help you to ensure that you're going to have this 
vigorous, thick stand of novel endophyte tall fescue without any possibility or with very low possibility that you could have a substantial amount of toxic tall fescue come back in that field. And so it's a matter of going through about a, a two-year process of, of um, uh, number one, controlling the seed production from the toxic fescue the first year, first spring. Then at some time during that, that later in that spring or early summer, you, uh, you either use uh, glyphosate um, would round up to kill that stand, or you could use tillage. I mean, there's, there's more than one way. You don't have to necessarily spray, but we, most people with success use a, 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 that one treatment with glyphosate. Then we plant what's called a smother crop. So we use a, a summer annual, which is a, um, set, you know, sorghum Sudan or millet or something like that, which is a, um, a, 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 a sort of a tall growing aggressive summer plant that then anything that any, any fescue that survives the spray, um, it gets, it gets suffocated, it gets smothered by that, uh, by that big crop of Southern summer annual that comes on. Then at the end of that crop, you provide another, uh, an, another spray to kill any plants that have escaped at that point. And at that point you have a clean field that can be then planted. You didn't, you don't have any carryover seed from that, from that year. And, you have uh, essentially um, eliminated most of those toxic seeds, and then you can go ahead and plant your your um, your novel endophyte tall fescue. So that's the there. There's several, like I said, there's several systems, and you can learn more about that if you want the detail. Now, I the way I am, Peter, again, because I'm so busy with my job at NC State, I have so many tasks and everything on the farm. This idea of I control seed production today so that I can plant this way out there in the fall and then maybe I can use it in a couple of years. It became daunting to me because, because um, number one, I know that I've got seed around the edge of the field. I've got seed that, you know, maybe I have, you know, don't. I'm not that great with a sprayer, right? I mean, nobody, nobody is if they really look back behind them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that you miss spot, you know, you missed it. And so, so I just knew that I would do that. I, I knew if I go out there and spray this glyphosate, I'm going to miss some areas and they're going to be toxic fescue plants there. I'm going to have a second chance, but I'm really not very good, Peter. So I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not that comforted by the second chance. So I had, I had kind of got right up on the verge of starting down this path and then freaked myself out. I mean, spooked myself by thinking, oh no, I don't think I can do that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can, you know. And so I would then the dates would pass and I'd be too late. Right. So so one year I did that and 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 I I was I, this is going to be the year I'm going to do it. And and unfortunately rain happened. We didn't get the hay cut. I started to I, I knew we were in pollination. I knew there was going to be some viable seed and I'm like, dang it, I did it again. Okay. Ne I wait for next year is by far the easiest thing for me to do, right? Just mm. status quo. Um, and I went back and checked the cows and they're laying up in a mud hole, gasping for breath, drooling. And yeah, I got really, I, I was like, dang it. So I cut that hay knowing there was seed there. And uh, I decided, you know, I'm going to go fill the sprayer with life safe and I'm going to kill it. That's what I did. I wasn't, there was no two year process in my mind or whatever. All it was, was all I got to do is fill that sprayer and kill it. And I decided I'm not even going to think about it. I'm not going to tell dad. I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. Let it grow out two weeks after we got the hay off. It was, it had to be anyway, because it took us that long to get it done. I took the sprayer out and I sprayed 20 of the best acres of land we've got. And then I called my dad and said, dad, guess what I just did? <laughs> He's like, you what? You don't ever do something like that without talking to me. And I said, well, I know dad, but that's why I hadn't done it yet. Cause we, we talk so much about it. We'd never get it done. Mm -hmm. So the front field, which we call it our pride and joy started to turn Brown. And I was like, okay, we're planting the cover crop. And so we, uh, we planted, uh, actually we had a field day coming up and that was part of what I had in my mind. I was going to, you know, I was going to go 
explain the whole process of this field day and here I'd blown it. So I decided, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And so we planted sorg different varieties of sorghum, Sudan and millet and, and in strips. And we had, a, had a wonderful field day and a lot of interest uh, from folks. And, and I, and so anyway, that's how I got started. But, but today, so today what we're doing, we're going across the farm like that, killing some, and then we're farming it with annuals. Um, and when I say annuals, I mean a plant that goes in the ground in the spring and it grows for the summer and you, you, you're done with it in the fall. Then you plant a winter one that goes from the fall up until the next spring. And, and we, we found that those have quite a role in our farm because there's times when fescue is not very good. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the times is in the middle of summer. And if you can have that, that summer forage, it's really powerful. So, so I, um, so I, I sort of fell in love with the annuals and, and, uh, and yet I can't have too many of them because I can never, I'll never in, I'll never be done planting if I have too many of them. It's just, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't have that much time. So I want a perennial plant, uh, and, and on the farm, like tall fescue or a mixture of, of, of forages perhaps, um, but the annuals seem to have a role in our farm. So, um, I, right now I'm, I'm a, I'm even more a bigger believer than ever, Peter. And I have been thinking about some of the, the, I said the back part of the farm that's still all in Kentucky 31. I'm, I'm just going to quit worrying about what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the sprayer back there and start doing, you know, and, and do what I know I can, I can get myself to do, which is go kill some and, and put some annuals and then convert over time. Now, what, what this kind of, the reason this is really critical for our farm. And I said, for some people in the big, this big cow calf, uh, extensive kind of management thing where you have a lot of land and you don't have that many cows or whatever that works. But for us, we, I, I really wanted to do something to have a more viable enterprise so that maybe when I retired, I could actually, you know, have a self-supporting farm and, you know, make enough money off of it to do some of the things that I like to do to farm, to maybe buy, buy a new tractor or something like that, you know? And, um, so we got started in the local beef business and this started out slow with just a few animals uh, for family, but then we started selling some beef to, to friends and, and, um, and more distant related family, you know, that we, we kind of had the friends and family price. We never made that much money on it in those days, but but uh, we did we did make a lot of people happy, and we connected a lot of people to our farm. And uh, we came up with a name for the product, which our product is called Blake's Beef. It was named after a one of my nephews who worked the farm, and then uh, unfortunately uh, passed from uh, from cancer at a young age. But he he was uh, he he's still around here on this farm. One of the reasons that I I um, that I'm here all the time. Uh, you, once you're connected here, I don't think you really ever leave. So, uh, so anyway, Blake, uh, Blake loved the beef. And so we named the product after him so that we had a, you know, we, we really wanted a story and something people would say, well, Blake's beef, what's that? And then we could launch into that little sales pitch. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, but we, we, I really believe in our product. Our beef is very uh, flavorful and, and I love all beef and all beef is good. You know, we've had that discussion. But uh, there's something about um, animals that are a little bit older in age, as ours are, uh, because they're growing on a forage diet most of their life. They they don't you know they're not pushed really rapid gains like I was trained to do in the feedlot, and they eat a lot of different plants. And even on our farm, that's mostly tall fescue. We've got like maybe 20 species that that are significant. And so all of the compounds from those plants are stored in their fat, and all of those have fla have flavor profiles. And so we know everybody's farm's a little different. And so our beef has a little different flavor profile than one down the road or whatever. It's kind of like wine, right? It start, you start realizing this is, this is some artisan type product. And so, um, so we started thinking about it and, and promoting it that way. And uh, we started, we, you know, we, had, we learned a few things along the way. Um, we had, a, a, occasionally we'd have a customer come say, I want to buy some of this grass-fed beef. And we've never called ours grass-fed beef. We call ours pasture-raised and pasture-finished because we do feed a little bit of feed if it's necessary. 
And, uh, and you say, well, why would it be necessary? Well, again, we have droughts, we have cycles in forage availability. There's all kinds of times when the best solution for us to keep the animals growing and to keep them healthy and, and, uh, and on the, on, and on the, the schedule we need them to be on so that we know what day they're going to be ready. Uh, we do a little bit of supplemental feeding, but it's, it's not, uh, we're not, we're not standing them in a lot and feeding them. You know, we are, we are truly supplementing the forage base. And what we found, what I found was that if you had mostly fescue, you had to do a lot of that feeding, Peter, mm -hmm. if you had Kentucky 31 fescue. Mm -hmm. Once we started putting these annuals and these animals on the annuals, it was a different story. We didn't have to give them any supplemental feed. They gained rapidly. They did extremely well. And, um, and we also, uh, along the way, started establishing novel endophyte tall fescue so that we we're getting back to this perennial. And those animals are the same way. They're, they're slick. So today, which it's a cool day today in June, but uh, we'll have a hot day tomorrow. The, all of our young animals are on a non-toxic diet. Our, uh, our, our first calf heifers that are now bred and, and coming with their first calves, our beef animals, uh, they're all in, in, are finishing up either um, ryegrass or oats and oats and uh, triticale mixtures and, and novel endophyte tall bed. That's what they've been on. Compared to the cows, the mature cows that are on toxic fescue, it's night and day. So I, all, I, never, I never go see the, the mature cows last in the day. I always <laughs> see them. And then I go to the young groups and move them because there's hugs to, to realize this is what I want. This is what I want that other group to be like. So, so one day, uh, ladies, so, we'll it's, get a you big, older. it's a big process. It's a big process, but it's a challenge uh, that I'm trying to get a little bit done every year and, and go ahead and get this conversion done. Now, what, uh, what happened over this process? And, and again, the, the, the getting away from the non-toxic forage was key for us being able to actually make any money on it uh, you know i mean the, the thing is that if you had to feed, if you have to carry a lot of feed to them you're not going to make any money on it uh, we just feeds expensive here and when i say carry i mean carry i mean it's labor you know it's expensive so um so we we started doing a little bit better once we got into the annuals and we could get these animals to be appropriately fattened because that's the key they need to be fat um, to be able to, to, to have the kind of product that we, that we like to eat. Uh, it's another thing that we learned. We had, uh, we had, well, I said, we had people asking for grass fed and we, we tell them we don't have grass fed. We got something better. And occasionally they would say, oh no, I'm not eating it if it's not hundred percent grass fed. And we said, okay, well, you know, that's been, it's not, you know, if you change your mind, come back, but we're not, we, you know, we, we believe in our product and it's really good. And I, I'd oftentimes say, well, Thanks for stopping in. How about here? Try, try a pound of hamburger and see what you think. Well, they come back and they'd say, man, that's the best hamburger I ever ate. Well, you know, and I say, well, okay, it's, you know, and, and then we started having some customers come in and say, is this that grass fed? And I said, I'd say, no, it's, it, you know, it's not it's good. <laughs> I need to, and I had one old man say, I want, I got to have me some fat meat. He said, I bought a grass fed steer and I got to, I, I want to know, is this meat going to be fat? Mm -hmm. I said, well, not, not, not that, you know, <laughs> yeah. but that's that, what that, he, meant. he wanted. The, he wanted uh, something that was like the choice grade, which if you go to the grocery store and buy beef, you're going to find choice grade, which means it's got a little bit of fat inside the meat that gives it flavor and gives it, um, you know, palatability, makes it taste better. And so that's what we strive for is having that choice grade. And we know we, you know, we generally will feed a little bit to get that uh, animals to be that great. Now, what's happened in North Carolina, Peter, and this has been a very exciting for me to see this happen and be part of it. But we have we have dramatically grown our local meat uh, segment. And we have again, we have a lot of a lot of uh, what we call conventional meat production in North Carolina, very, you know, healthy and good products and all that, but big scale, you know, big. Uh, big scale production where these th this type product really fits small farms and again uh, I, I said it's kind of an artisan type product so it's it's got to be priced somewhat above the commercial type products considerably above some of it it's got to have a good story behind it it's got to be a wonderful mm -hmm. product and all of those are the case so we've worked with lots of farmers to, to establish that 
kind of a product and and they've done extremely well with it and and the beef systems in North Carolina could be a mixture of production for local market as well as commercial calves leaving and being finished in uh, other states, you're not going to have feedlots for beef in North Carolina. So those options, but it's important to have both to to maintain the industry. Um, and, and, and that's what we do. So we, we have 100 cows and we finish 50. So most of our steers, the males, are, finished, are, are for the local beef market. Then maybe something that's a little bit smaller or maybe doesn't have quite as much muscling. I mean, for one reason or another, maybe it's a little bit high spirited for, you know, or whatever we, then those will go. And, and we don't need them all because we have a limited market and it gives us the ability to get the very best ones for our product. So then those go to the feedlot in wherever, go to the normal marketing chains and our cows, our, our cows, once they uh, are highly experienced and they go on to be market cows, they go in conventional, um, uh, you know, ground beef market for the most part. Mm -hmm. Well, so in we, addition we to the of... market, you've you've got uh, um, you can't carry all your animals on the land resource with the forage resource. You you have to do that kind of balancing as you go through a year. Correct. So we've had to do that. We we used to run 150 cows uh, before we finished any. Now we run 100 cows. And that's about it, it. It takes that kind of a trade off. So it's about uh, for about every one you finish, you have to give up a cow. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that and it's worked out. It's worked out well for us because I now I don't have quite as many cows. I don't have to manage quite as many births. Uh, you know that sort of thing. The animals I you know once I get them uh, off their you know we'll get them through their babyhood and we wean them. You know we wean them and get them on forages. Then, then I get to I get to have them for almost two years, you know, for a, basically a year and a half. Once they're all trained and they're we got the ones out that are little. As I said, we occasionally have one that doesn't like us, and we we send them to, to town. But uh, we are able to, um, you know, we're able to really much more easily manage those animals than that other fifty cows with babies that I that I gave up. So I like it from that standpoint. It's also given us the ability to be a, a significant player in the, the local the local need, and it gives me some credibility as I work with farmers because this is something that's getting ready to grow even more in North Carolina. We've been very blessed to have more small um, scale processors that are inspected by USDA or or the state to uh, so that we can sell the meat, um, and and that's a whole process if you if you raise animals for for the local market and you want to actually sell the meat, it has to be inspected and then you have to have a license to, to handle it and to deliver it to people and that sort of thing. So there's some operations where you buy the cow and they truck it to, uh, that's different than having the ability to sell individual cuts or yes. so that's yeah. what you're referring to here. And that doesn't work. You know, the old system, we, we called it freezer beef. And we used to sell a few of those <laughs> too along the way, but that was where somebody would just come and say, yeah, I want a beef, take it over here to, to Danville, to the small processor. They're not inspected or anything, but they, 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 you know, we basically send them a bill for how much the animal was, and then they deal with the processor and get the meat. Mm -hmm. And that's fine, except you're talking about four to 500 pounds of meat and, and, and of all, all the meat, you know, all mm -hmm. the stuff that you're like, what in the world do you do with a, with a, uh, hanger steak or what, well, you know, with some of the stuff that you get. So, so we, people have been more successful here, uh, selling directly to, to consumers, small, small farmers, uh, do very well with an on-farm store or, uh, farmer's market. And again, a lot of our population wants this. They want to know a farmer. They want to say, you know, my farmer raises Charolais cattle. Or, I mean, they want to feel this connection to agriculture. It's a real common thing across mm -hmm. society now in our state. And I think a lot of places in the country. And so uh, this gives them the ability to meet a farmer face to face. They pay a pretty high price at those farmer's markets for the meat. Um, and, and in fact, when you have a very small volume like that you have to charge a lot if you want to make any money at it it's it's not a ball it's not a large volume kind of business it's a small volume so that's good for the very small ones the medium-sized one you know people that want to get a little bit bigger like us 
uh, that want to farm rather than sitting at a farmer's market. There are several companies that have started to what we call aggregate, but they work with a team of farmers and, and so that they can create a year round supply. So they can schedule with those farmers. We need your cattle to be ready in January. We need yours to be ready in February, yours in March. And that way they can have this planned year round supply so that they can have fresh, fresh product, which a lot of people are, would demand. And a lot of the smaller guys do it frozen so they can, they don't sell at the farmer's market. It goes, stays in the cooler, it goes back home, goes back in the freezer, you know, but mm -hmm. if it's fresh, you have to sell it much more quickly. But they, they've been very successful. We have multiples of those across the state that have sprung up and are working with farmers like us. And that's what we, we work with one of those and, and supply beef during a three-month period of time mm. to supply the animals. We take them to the processor and drop them off. And that's all we do. We, we, we don't. But I'll tell you, it's a kick to say to friends or family, hey, let's go down to Bull City Burgers and Brews and have some of our hamburger, have some burgers that came from our farm. Mm. And you walk in. And they got a little sign on the on the on the uh, door there by where you walk in that says today's meat is from Triple Creek Ranch, Blake's Beef, and uh, and my you know smiling face like okay I'm the farmer. <laughs> so it's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful model for them because people again just somebody going for a burger in downtown Durham connects to a farm and a farmer, and so mm -hmm. it's been so so it, so anyway this thing is really developing in North Carolina. Now, the final little piece of this, and back to the, 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 the reason for us to need to work on our forage systems and get away from just limping along on something that's toxic. Um, we have a major investment that's been made in the state to expand this local processing capacity. So we have a, uh, we have a, a program that was uh, uh, created by the legislature from some of the COVID uh, money from the CARE Act because of the effect on meat supply that we saw right in the beginning of the pandemic and the, the explosion of interest in these local products. I mean, everybody that had local meat to sell sold out in like days, you know, once people no meat in the grocery store, well, we have a, enough of a network to where they, we, we steered them to where they could buy some meat, but then you realize, well, that's gone. Yeah. And, um, and so a lot of people started, you know, speeding up trying to get stuff ready for the market. And they booked the processing and the processing booked up to where you couldn't get anything processed. And I had one, for example, I had an extra because our, the, the company we supply, we're not on a contract. So we don't, they don't really want to be an integrator. They don't want to be a contract driven integrator. They have like gentlemen's agreement. Well, they, they called all the, all the growers together on a zoom meeting and said, Hey, we're going to have to, uh, we're not gonna be able to take all the animals we committed to because well, the restaurants are closed. You know, we're trying to figure mm -hmm. out what to do, but we don't know how many, but it's going to be some. So I had one. Uh, they, so they said basically of mine, uh, there was one that I couldn't bring and I wasn't planning on killing one this year. And so of, of, of processing one. So I had one to do. Well, I started calling around and they're like next year, you got a year to wait. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, I sort of, a. Uh, an opening came up and I was able to get in and get one done, but, but there was no, there was no way to get anything done. And so we could have grown some this past year if we had capacity. Well, when the care act money came down and the legislature started figuring out what are we going to do with all this money? You know, it's gotta be something that's going to help some of the, the things that happened because of the pandemic and this meat supply was one of them. So they decided to put money into helping all of the small processors. And we have some 16 to 20, depending on how you count them and categorize them of, of sort of mom and pop federally inspected um, small abattoirs that, that cut process package and, and work with small farmers. We have um, we've now increased up to where there's about 1800 farmers in the state that have a meat handlers license, which just means they have the approval to go get the meat up and pick it up and take it to the customers. Um, so there's a lot of people getting involved in this. So this program um, that was created by the legislature and has been running for the last uh, about eight or nine months now has provided funding to all these small processors for them to increase their capacity and their efficiency. So everything from training new employees to uh, new pieces of equipment, um, uh, you know, you'd be surprised. I, I've learned a lot because this was all competitive grants program and I got to review a lot of the grants, but 
Um, it's it, you'd be surprised how much a bacon slicer costs. <laughs> it's unbelievable, unbelievable. <laughs> but if you don't have one, you you're not going to do very good with bacon. And if you've got an old crappy one, your bacon's going to be not not very good. So anyway, we we have up to at this point twenty six million dollars was invested in the local processing industry. Hmm. Now, the assumption is once the capacity is there, there's going to be animals to process and there's going to be customers to buy this local meat. Well, not, no, they're not necessarily. Hmm. So now our new challenge is we, we are going to have to grow into that capacity if we, you know, if we want this program to actually be beneficial, uh, these processors got to be able to get more animals. And that means our local customers have to eat more local meat. So we're uh, getting ready to launch some pretty major educational initiatives to to do both to do both of that to help the market to to develop you know to help continue the market to develop, but also to work with farmers so that the product is good. Mm-hmm. Because if you take uh, if you just even a young animal if you take them off toxic Kentucky Thirty One Tall Fescue. Uh, this time of year and you take them down and process them, it will not be a good eating experience. I do not recommend that at all. So and that's what our farmers know. I mean, they don't, they don't really, they don't, they've not ever feed lotted animals. They don't know what an animal looks like when they're done. So anyway, we're, we're, uh, it's an exciting time here. Yeah. And, and, well, and the, the number one between- recommendation is you've got to do something about your toxic rescue if you really want to make mm-hmm. this thing work. Well, and let's let's increase the pull by making sure that everyone knows that eating red meat won't kill you, uh, and in fact, um, it may may actually help improve various conditions. But that's a conversation for another day. Um, last yeah, the other, thing, and let, let me let me just expand that one point a little bit, Peter. <clears throat> and you say that that absolutely, there's no question about that. The um, Beef is a healthy food, and my one of my nutritionists I work with, she always says it this way. It really sticks with me. There are no unhealthy foods. There's only unhealthy diets, and so all food. I mean, all foods are are have a place in your diet, and and so it's just you know you need to have a diet that is balanced and and you know it has a lot of diversity, a lot of variety, and I mean that's the way we all want to eat. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with sitting down to a big steak or whatever, as long as you're not doing, you know, if you do it every day, I mean, even I would, even, even you and I would gain a lot of weight, whatever, if we, you know, so you got to be reasonable. We could have a long conversation about that, Matt. I know we can, Peter. I didn't I, anyway, so the point (laughs) being, the point being that, um, yeah, yes, beef is good. Now, the point I wanted to make is that uh, it's all good. And we have Mm -hmm. producers that are doing very good with grass fed. And I don't want to say anything negative about it. They have, they're using a lot of annuals. They're using, they're mm-hmm. not using any toxic fescue. They have, um, they have a system that is allowed them to do that, but they're very rare. That's very rare. And it's very mm-hmm. expensive to do it. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of people that have adopted this pasture finished, pasture raised. And we do have production protocols uh, at, with NC State Extension that you can find on that if you're interested in. It's just kind of local beef guidelines. If you Google that, you'll find them. But um, we we really uh, we we have found through survey work that that whether you feed them a little bit of grain or not, um, it does not have much effect on the 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 fatty acids and the other uh, proponent the, the other parts of beef that the grass fed has said this is so much better. Well, any animal that's been most of their life on mostly forages is going to have that different composition. I talked about the flavor earlier. They're going to have different compounds there than what we see in feedlot beef. It's all good. I mean, it's all good. But I, like I said, for many reasons, I prefer to eat Blake's beef because that's what I mean. Because again, I'm... I'm, You you wouldn't be prejudiced at all. I I understand that. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not at all prejudiced, but I can open the freezer and I'm planning on doing that on the way home today. And, Excellent. and Excellent. I've still got some steaks, you know, yeah. eventually we're just hamburger, but. Um, well, some of us prefer anyway. charcoal. Some of us prefer gas. It's all good. Um, yeah. What just last question for you before I give you a chance to ask me something, if you care to, and that is, what are you reading these days? Anything, any books that you're enjoying at this moment or. Do you have time to well, do that? 
yes. Um, I, I, um, I've really taken an interest in, and this is all related to this, and, and, and I think you're aware of this. I've taken a deep interest in the regenerative grazing movement. And um, this, is a, this is a group of folks that have kind of uh, um, adopted the, the principles of, gra- of good grazing management that have been around for a long time. I changed it just a little bit around how you how you do it or think about it, but with the idea of regenerating healthy soil uh, as a part of what we do. And, and I'll tell you that if you do a good job of grazing management, you will do that. But I've been trying to figure out kind of what the, because this has become a big movement. Many of our readers would know names like Gabe Brown and, uh, and others uh, that, that are involved in that. And I'm trying to figure, I'm really trying to figure that out, Peter, because most of our farmers are doing some, um, some practices that are something on the, on the lines of regenerative grazing. Um, but it's not a cookie cutter type thing. You know, this is a very individualized type of management. So I've been reading, uh, some of the foundational books of, of the, of the regenerative grazing movement, the ones that they recommend you read. So it's one called, um, Man, Cattle, and Veld that I just finished that is, is uh, from a, a former rancher in South Africa talking about uh, regenerative grazing. I'm reading, I'm, I'm now reading um, Gay Brown's book, uh, Dirt to Soil, and, and to try to understand his philosophies and how it's done up in, up in the, nor- you know, the, the northern Midwest, way up towards the Canadian border where he's from. And, uh, and I'm, I, I, and then there's a lot of, you know, so that that's my main reading right now. Um, I also early just before I started those, I, I read Woody Lane's book, um, uh, capturing sunlight. And I, I really like that one. I, I, I'm a short story kind of guy because I grew up with a short story writer. And, um, and so I like, I like uh, Woody's book because it's a, it's a, it's a short, it's, it's a collection of, of short stories and, and gives some really great ideas it comes, always comes back to the principles and concepts in the setting of a, of kind of a practical story. And, and so I, I would recommend that one to anybody called Captivating, uh, Capturing Sunlight by Woody Lane. Excellent. Um, Matt, thank you for your time. If you have any questions for me, um, I've failed uh, repeatedly to, I get so engrossed in the conversation, I forget to remind people of who I'm talking to. Um, but that's just having a conversation here. So d- do you have any questions you'd like to ask me before I let you get to the freezer and head home? No, I think I'm good. I'm good, Peter. And actually before the freezer, I've got to go move, uh, four groups of cattle. And, uh, again, pandemic has allowed me to be daily on the farm and I've not done that for, for since I, since I came here in 82 and it's mm-hmm. been 82 years. So it's been a real pleasure for me. And I've, I've been, again, I've, I've taken this interest in regenerative grazing. And, and one of the things they say is you must move your cattle every day. And, uh, I don't necessarily believe that, but I'm, I believe in, in experience, in, in, making judgment after experience. So, uh, for the last year I've been moving, uh, four to five groups of animals every day. Mm-hmm. Got one group now I'm moving twice a day mm-hmm. and I think it's worthwhile. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer in it. If you happen to be on your farm every day. Now, if you don't happen to be, it's, it's, it's a different ball game, but, and I'm getting ready to experience that Peter as things open back up and I go back to work. Um, but I've got a, a helper I've been having with me a lot during this time. And he's uh, he's an old traditional tractor driver or whatever, but he's surprised at how easy it is to roll up that poly wire. So. Mm-hmm. Well, somewhere along the line, there's that, that saying that the best fertilizer is the footsteps of the farmer. And certainly being on observing pasture quality, animal condition, uh, what what's ahead of you in the rotation, what's behind you in the rotation, all of that and and whatever the details of that management are, it's it's management. It's a critical part 
um, to, to success, however it actually looks in detail. So I look forward to hearing more about what you've learned through this enforced exper experiment you've been undergoing for a year. Um, thanks again, Matt. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks, Peter.